Texas Lutheran University. Welcome to the first regional conference on pedagogy and learning. And this is the beginning of an idea that we hope will spread across the region of South Texas. And that in years to come, this conference will continue and that we'll have participants from all over the region. This is a conference for fellow travelers to where we can network and talk about our aspirations for these students. And I know we all hope that when they leave here, they have known enough to pass your classes, always true, but usually. But they've known enough specific knowledge to get that first job. But most importantly, that they've learned how to be self-learners in our classes. Because we know they don't. But upon graduation, learning really starts. To get us started, we're pleased to have Dr. Steve Roman here to give a keynote talk. In the last year of the previous century, Dr. Roman earned a PhD at the Economics <laughs> School of Human Communications. After graduation, he joined the TLU faculty, and that was also in the last year of the previous century. But that's proven to be our good fortune. Twice, Dr. Roman has chaired the Department of English and Communications. He can be a slow learner. He teaches eight sections a year like the rest of us do, he's found time to publish scholarly articles, to write chapters in books, and in fact, to write several textbooks in their entirety. He presents at numerous conferences, and in November of 2014, he has been invited to give a TED Talk, and that's available online if you haven't seen it, and if you haven't, I urge you to Google Dr. Roman's TED Talk in San Antonio and see our brains are a Twitter. Dr. Broman, in a, a slightly different context, I assure you we are all a Twitter, waiting to hear your keynote address, which is titled, Teaching is Persuasion. Join me in welcoming, welcoming Dr. Broman. Teaching is a lot of things, and uh, I'm here today to try to problematize what we think teaching is. But there's a lot of things teaching could be, and you've heard from, from Dr. Sieben that what I'm interested in is this idea of teaching as persuasion. We often think of teaching as information, and I think that that puts us in kind of the wrong sort of vibe for what we might be able to accomplish. And I'm interested in what problems we could create if we think about teaching as persuasion. So I don't have solutions for you. That's what the rest of you who are presenting the rest of the day get to do. I get to cause problems and sit down. <laughs> so if you're with me to cause some problems, we are going to cause a few specific kinds of problems. So the nature of the problem is here first, and I know that looks like somebody you know, it's not. <laughs> the second area there is persuasion, as you can see, sort of Don Quixote there surrounded by sad arrows. And the third section is possibilities. I know that kind of looks like a bad version of the Deathly Hallows, but we'll get there. So let's talk about the problem. And first, yes, that's not him. <laughs> but as he indicated in an email to me, uh, you know, if that guy ever killed somebody, I mean, he's afraid that he'd have to go on the run. <laughs> These are internet memes. Internet memes are where what they do when they're not doing our classes, they're creating humorous content for us all to see. So what I was interested in is how do students respond to all the different ways that we teach? I have a feeling that most of you have like a tribal identity with one of these. You know, this is me. I'm a flipped classroom person, right? All I do is discuss and I'm brilliant at it, you know? And maybe some of you do a couple of them, but, you know, and I understand that these cross apply, you know, you're thinking about all the ways in which these six categories mix and that I'm totally wrong about this. I know Olson's thinking that. <laughs> but let's just pretend for a second that these might be kind of separate as methodological things. We know what lectures are. Slide decks is the current kind of like Terry Price style lingo for PowerPoint because it includes keynotes, so it's more open, anyway. <laughs> Discussion, small groups, high impact courses, flip classes, and they connect up together, but I'm interested in what are the students, this is the problem, is the students don't buy any of this. So let's see. This is a first world problems meme. 
They just expect that our lectures are going to be boring. I mean, that's what you expected this morning, right? I mean, that's why you have so much coffee. <laughs> they think that we're bored. But what I'm interested in is those other five categories, which are the things that we're supposed to do to be innovative teachers. Like, lecture's not innovative anymore, you know, like maybe 600 <laughs> years ago, right? So we're like, we need to do something innovative. They just expect us to be bad at lecture. Think about the tone that's going to happen in some of these others when they evaluate our other teaching methods. It's not just that you're bad at teaching anymore. It's that you're actively anti-teaching. <laughs> Discussion is what happens when not only do the, uh, when you take your favorite students in class who didn't do the reading and you who didn't read your own reading for the class get together and talk about something else for 20 minutes. You can see the recurrent theme. You do what we call high impact practices because you don't know how to teach any better. The students are sure that this is why we do this. And many of you have felt this blowback from students. So this is a problem that we have to address in some ways. I'm not saying they're right. They're spending their time making internet memes instead of studying. So they can't be entirely right. But there is a difference between how students who are resisting what we're doing with these methods, what that feels like compared to students who are resisting our boring lectures. And I'm interested in what we would do about that problem if we were interested in reaching them. So let's move forward. In some ways, you can't blame them, though. Small group reciprocal learning. Don't you remember continuing the conversation in this very room 10 years ago? Flip charts, markers, small groups, put them in a pile. Do it again, more piles. And we imagine this sort of small group and reciprocal, it looks like great, like this. Like we're doing all kinds of cool stuff. What happens is like this guy who's bored out of his mind. If I had flip charts and tables in here when you walked in, there would have been a whole different set of body language from you folks. So don't judge these students too harshly. Because this is what they experience. They are worksheeted to death as people plan for you know, uh, all the tests that they have to do. Every subject, every day, worksheets, worksheets, worksheets. They're trained, right? They're trained to not be able to do anything else. Uh, this is the training capacity model. So right, they're conditioned to sort of think that, OK, when I go to class, I'm going to get this every day. This is my son, Sam. He's a good student. He has an attitude like me, though. <laughs> and I asked him, you know, how much of your day is spent doing worksheets? He's good enough at math that I believe his number. So all day, this is what he does. He's had four Spanish teachers this year. One, they know she does not speak Spanish. <laughs> they needed a warm body who could dish out worksheets. So what the students know is that what fake teachers do is make you do work in class. And they're waiting to go to college where they can experience the real teachers. And so when we give them stuff that reminds them of this, we remind them of all the bad education and all the bad teachers they've ever had. And they want to know what a good teacher looks like. And you give them reciprocal group work at the beginning of class. And they don't know whether you count. Right? So I'm not saying not to do it. But I'm saying that we have to think about it in a different way. And this was taken off the TLU Yik Yak three weeks ago. So our students are assuming that if we're doing innovative teaching, it's because we simply are incompetent at anything else. So what do we do about these students? I mean, we ignore them. Hey, some students need to fail. Maybe. No, we're at a teaching and learning conference. We don't want to say that. What we have, though, is a, is, a, is a persuasion problem. They think we're not willing to teach. They think we're lazy. We're sure that they're lazy. So between that lack of communication, we have to find a way to bridge that gap. So that's the problem. So what do we do about solutions? Well, <laughs> I've only got 12 minutes left. I don't know. 
Uh, but let me, let me give you a model. Let me talk about this question of persuasion here. This is uh, Don Quixote for us. This is the student's brain, really large. In fact, it's probably more like that, right? That's how we think of it. You know, kind of uh, you know, ravenous, sort of monstrous and horrifying. And here we are, you know, sadly, you know, tilting at windmills, slightly delusional, you know, to still be doing this after all. Anyway, we're trying to reach them. We're trying to, how are we going to get our, our, our stuff across to the students? So what are we going to do? Well, there's a variety of theories of persuasion and how this works, right? If we think about teaching as not only do you have to convince them to listen, which we kind of know about intuitively, but given what we've just seen, there's a, there's a, there's a huge gap in terms of uh, what we have to get over in order to get, to get by with them. Uh, this is the elaboration likelihood model, also called the heuristic and systematic model. And it's a model developed in advertising, but it's been studied for 30 years in a lot of different environments. And the argument is that there's two modes of processing, central and peripheral. Central is logic. You're thinking. You're processing the information. That's what we want them to do, right? Unfortunately, huge amounts of persuasion take place peripherally. These are, uh, to use other language, uh, heuristic cues. You know, this is, this is Tiffany C. Uh, world with we're cognitive misers. So heuristic cues are things like if you're funny, I like you, right? If you're tall, I respect you. Things like this. So they make these simple judgments about us. And like, you give them a worksheet, and now that, therefore you're the worst teacher they ever had in high school. Uh, and so they make these judgments. So ideally, what we would want is we would say, hey, we need to get you over here thinking, because that's why we're here. This is school, right? You should be thinking. But the problem is it's not possible. You can't get people to centrally process information and leave all the heuristic cues behind. You simply can't. If you look like a Muppet, you will always, and that guy does look like a Muppet. I am sorry. But I mean, you know, if you look like a Muppet, you will always look like a Muppet to them. And you just have to own the Muppet. You can't separate it. The best you can get is parallel processing. And it turns out that the two things that determine whether or not we can parallel process are motivation and ability. You know, do you have the capacity, ability-wise, to deal with the information I'm giving you? And are you motivated to deal with it? And our problem is, is we often don't think about that motivation picture as much as we can. We think, I'm here to teach, and they should just love that. You know, I'm not here to pander to them as if there's something besides pandering. You know? And so because we focus on ability when we think about these things, we design our courses in these sort of weird ways. So you think about lecture. Lecture is entirely an ability-based sort of function. We lecture because people don't read the book. They don't have the ability to read the book, according to us. So therefore, we lecture them to explain the material that they can't be held responsible for dealing with on their own. But we end up in this sort of vicious cycle here. You know, if I'm lecturing you because you don't understand the material, well, how do I know that you have the capacity to understand my lecture? I'd what? I'd have to lecture you about the lecture to get the, so you end up with this sort of trouble, uh, and you're still around on this sort of like sad sort of solution. You end up with this question of operant conditioning and training capacity again. To what extent are we training the students to never read because we will help them with the lecture with all the convenient PowerPoint slides that will load up to the eraser site later so they can study for their test? We're training them not to read. We're training them not to listen to us. Slides available. See you at the final. So what do we do about this? Because it turns out that to connect with those ravenous students, this picture gives me nightmares. I love it. Uh, <laughs> is that we have to be able to focus on the connection between ability and motivation. It turns out that ability thinks things that are easy to do are dumb. We don't like easy. Easy is not fun. You know what's, what's great? What's great is, is, is stories and jokes. Those are complex. right? What's easy is sweeping the floor. Right? We don't often are motivated to do what's easy. But motivation is difficult, too. Some of you would say, hey, you know what, lecture, I lecture to, to give them my passion, right? Because they will, they will connect with my sort of ineffable amazingness and somehow sort of connect with what I do, and that will enliven it all, dead poet society for them. <coughs> Trouble is, I'm not sure that happens. I don't doubt that there are some who know neither physics nor mathematics very well. That puts a considerable challenge on a speaker who is going to speak on the relation of physics and mathematics. <laughs> A challenge which I, however, will not accept. <laughs> I published the, the title of the talk clear, in clear and precise language and didn't make it sound like it was something it wasn't. It's the relation of physics and mathematics. And if you find that in some spots it assumes some minor knowledge of physics or mathematics, I cannot help it. It was named. Uh, Richard Feynman has a Nobel Prize, so if you're like, hey, I'm a better lecturer than him, are you sure? Out. At the time, these messenger lectures were a gigantic, sort of had a huge impact on the teaching of science. He's reorienting sort of the basic ways in which you teach physics in terms of its order. And then his approach to telling jokes, right, was uh, it was drawing in people. You know, they were sort of like double the size of these lectures over time. 
because they were so popular. And so uh, for him, you know, we got a great lecture. And if you think you're better than him, that's great. I, uh, that's awesome. But if you're just like him or a little bit worse, you know, he's uh, ideally sort of connecting in terms of motivation and ability. He's reorienting the content, and he's giving you jokes and kinds of stuff that, you know, your dusty old physics professors, sorry, didn't, you know, necessarily do before. And we think that that's us, right? We're sort of invigorating. The audience is laughing at our jokes, you know, because they're laughing at our jokes. Uh, in fact, though, what often happens is this. He says the most boring class ever. Good year. So for materials, we're going to take 20,000 equivalent units, the 82 times, the 82 cents per equivalent unit cost. This goes on for two minutes, and he never looks up to note that his students are messing around and making videos and uh, pretending to shoot themselves in the head and squishing his head with their fingers while he lectures. <laughs> My question is, how do you know that you're not that guy? How do you know that you're better than Richard Feynman? I'm not sure that you do, because it turns out that we just rationalize we have confirmation bias. You have one student a semester tells you that was a life-changing lecture, you're like, done, I'm great, right? And all those other students who are like, this class was boring or didn't like your lecture, well, they're not cognitively complex enough to evaluate my teaching methods. You know, student evaluations are an inaccurate measure of what they really know. And the fact that 80% of them think I'm boring, they are boring. They don't know. How do you know what your lecture is? And so this is the sort of question, but we, we know this. So let's move it forward a little bit, because I'm uh, five minutes magically, to get through the rest of talking about motivation and ability on something besides lecture material. What do we do if we're moving over into these areas? And we often think, hey, if motivation and ability are the key, these things are all about motivation, aren't they? They're fun. They're doing activities. They're playing games. They're speaking. They hate it. <laughs> And it turns out that this is all about ability. When you look at the research on high impact practices and flipped classrooms and discussions, they all indicate that these are really good in terms of raising test scores. Not that students like them. Now, there are some that say that they like them, but not as many as you would think. These are also about ability. And we end up with this sort of like doubled level trained in capacity, where they think you do this because you can't teach. And then when you try to teach, they're like, oh, yeah, you're right. You can't teach. And then they can't listen to you anymore, and they're not. And you end up with this terrible thing where you meet the student in your office in March. And you're like, we just never connected. And then, you know, OK, so we got to fix that. So let's move on. Mark Twain tells a story about a teacher going back to class and saying teaching is like heaving 35 corks underwater at the same time. <laughs> right? You heard this story. This is a question of motivation and ability, not just for them listening, but for you creating your content. And so how do you deal with this? How do we avoid these sort of spirals of uncertainty that we usually get about the question of how do we increase our students' ability? How do we increase their motivation? And we have to do them at the same time. And we should turn it into something different, right? Something a little, a little bit better font, for example. You know, instead, well, let's think about this as complexity and simplicity. I already said sweeping the floor is boring, and jokes and stories are more fun, like Mark Twain's sort of uh, cork thing. Our job is to try to rebuild these sort of circles and think about the classic Venn diagram that you hate and say, well, how do we build this thing in the middle? How do we approach it with simplicity and complexity at the same time, regardless of our methodology, so that we can try to push the students to bridge that gap between us and them in terms of their attention? Remember, they think we're lazy. Even though 700 studies indicate that everything is better than lecture. Everything. I read one yesterday that was students reading text on the internet and taking a test is better than lecture. Like, it's not better than, the only thing worse than lecture is PowerPoint. There are some studies that indicate that with PowerPoint you learn less than if you were just speaking, although the students like it better because they think that they're learning, but they're not. You know, so I mean, we know that we are not lazy because we're doing complex teaching. You know, and we know that the research says that, hey, if we're doing something experimental, we're doing what we're supposed to be doing, but the students aren't still perceiving that. You know what these colleges are, what they have in common? They're Ku's favorite colleges. In 2013, he argued that these were the most innovative, high-impact practice places that you could find. There he is, lost in his PowerPoint. It turns out when you go to Rate My Professors, which I did earlier this week, nobody talks about high-impact practices. Now, it's not science, Rate My Professors, I understand. But all the students talk about their favorite and least favorite professors at Luther, Elon, and Valencia. And they talk about what a great lecturer they are and what a terrible lecturer they are. So I'm not sure how much high impact is happening when you look at what people are actually doing in their courses. And so I wonder, you know all this already. And are you falling away from your, uh, you know, your more rigorous and intensive practices because of bad student feedback because you aren't making a connection? And are you like these faculty? going back to the tried and true stuff you don't believe in, but you feel like we'll get by with the students. 
So this laziness line. George Koo and high impact folks will think if you're doing this, you're lazy. Students think if you're doing this, you're lazy. So we've got to find a way to bridge this line. And there's a reason why the line is there. You know, great work of art. Great work of art is ineffable. You know, couldn't replace it with words. It's the Mona Lisa, in case you don't remember. <laughs> and we think our great lecture is like the Mona Lisa. You know, amazing work of art, just like this right here. Not really. In fact, most paintings look like that, though. <laughs> and most lectures look like that. You know, Richard Feynman. I like him, I know. He's not for everybody, but I like him. Uh, but most lectures look like that. <laughs> People being consumed by their visual aids. Students hoping that the consumption will take place, like Tron. <laughs> you know, so it's hard to blame people for this line. You high impact people, you're Jackson Pollock people. I went to a Jackson Pollock exhibit in 1999. It was like all around the room, I just sat there. You know, looking and absorbing it. I loved it. Other people were like, walk through and they're like, hey, my kid could do that. Well, your kid didn't do that. <laughs> but your students, when you give them something complex and high impact, they're like, yeah, I could paint my shorts. That's not that hard. Everything that you do, you know, here's James Joyce. Ulysses. Yeah, I teach this in Irish literature class. You should take it. It's good. They see this, no punctuation, and they're like, yeah, this is a scribbling on the bathroom wall in a bar in Scotland. And what's the difference? I try to show them weird things, things like this. I was going to show you a piece of stand bricage, which is really intense, and you wouldn't want to see it anyway. Uh, but from a high impact perspective, that's how people are seeing it. From a low impact luxury perspective, that's how people are seeing it. So we need to sort of find a way to take what we know about persuasion, and I know I'm out of time, but I have a couple more minutes, to talk about some directions towards we might think about solutions. And you have to think of these solutions. I can't do them for you. You're probably a better teacher than I am, uh, which is evident after this speech. <laughs> So let's talk about this line and how we're going to fix it. And what I'm interested in is being able to draw connections between these two things and sort of fill out this Venn diagram where we have to be able to do both the simple and the complex at the same time in such a way that we draw things in the middle. And how do we get to it in the middle? Remember, we're thinking about this in terms of these ideas. They're thinking about it in terms of these ideas. Now, we spend all of our time, I think, when we try to become a better teacher, convincing the students that they're wrong about this and it's this instead. But if you look at the sort of matrix here, you don't have, they don't have to be right or wrong. Whoever's right about this, all we have to do is find the middle. And it ends up the same. So how do we find the middle? What do we do with this middle? Here are our teaching methods. And I have, a couple, I have four simple suggestions. And I don't think they're going to work. So, but they're designed to sort of provoke you to think further about what's going on. There's our student, sad in the middle, lost and alone. It looked really aggressive before. When you shrink it down, it looks sort of like sad and like filled with ennui. First, I think, think about lecturing at least once. Prove to them that you're not their high school teacher, that you actually have the capacity to get through a 50-minute lecture, but you've chosen not to lecture because you know it's not the best way to do it. And a lecture isn't the 15 minutes of here's what's due next time and here's how you have to turn it in at the beginning of class before you get to your high impact work. Like, see if you can get through material to show off to them for a second and then stop showing off. I don't know if Dr. Bollinger likes that idea, but it's an idea. Because this is what they think a good teacher looks like. You've seen Dead Poet Society, right? They do a lot of stuff. They go out on the moors, and they go into a cave. But what people remember about Dead Poet Society is Robin Williams performing in the front of class. They want to see that. So you have to train them not to see that if you want to do something else. And just like Picasso, Jackson Pollock, you're painting that way because you can't paint any other way. Maybe if you make some figures for us, then you move on. Anyway, that's the confrontational approach. That's my style. Second, maybe choose wisely. We have all these different approaches, high impact and not. And I have a feeling that we just do the same one over and over and over again. We plug it and chug it. Every day, a game. Every day, a debate. Every day, we're doing reciprocal reading. You know what today is? You're right. It's a day, so it's reciprocal reading day. You know, so I have a feeling that we often just get into our habit to do the same thing over and over again, and we're not choosing a variety. I would argue that a variety probably is helpful. And not every lesson requires this, or this, or this. And that maybe we should think further about our methods and find the method that connects with the material. My third option is to do it all. Every day, do a little bit of each. Every three weeks, make sure you have a day where you approach all of it. 
uh, variety is something that where it's harder for us to do, but it might be useful. And then last, what do we do as these students disappear? 7% of them, according to the DSM, are depressed at any given time. Only 40% of them actually came for your major. 46% find that they fall asleep in class. 13% couldn't afford the first choice, so they didn't want to be here with you. 7% only came because their parents told them. Uh, you know, only 70% of them want to actually study your major even, you know? So, I mean, they don't really want to be here and they're going to disappear. So, to sort of pull it all together, this is where we're at. We want to try to find a way to pull these things together. And I had a lot of ways to make sure that this made sense at the end, but I can see you running out of time. An important thing to remember is it was indicated that I, I, I spoke at TED. One of the things I talked about was how we retain less than 10% of information. Right, right now you're like, yeah, Roman spoke for 24 minutes and I only have two minutes worth of material. It's because you don't know what you're listening to. So if you shrink this in size, that's how much they're getting out of whatever it is we're doing. Whatever it is we're doing, they're remembering a tiny amount. So our challenge is to try to find our way through to make that happen at a higher level than it is. And I don't have a specific technique for you, but I would argue that attention, as a result of this TED argument, is more important than engagement. You can't get engagement without attention. And I don't think that we often sort of approach that. And so that would be number four, is trying to find a way to connect with attention. So I have more detailed ideas about this, but I only, I'm out of time. And so what I think is important is as we think about how do you build something. So this is an empty diagram, because you have to fill it. You have to figure out what makes sense for you. And I would challenge you that given what we know about how little we know and how little the students care, what can you do to take the ways in that they realistically process what it is that you're saying and move forward with it? This professor is a total <laughs> but she's a nice <laughs> That's me. And maybe in the end, that's the best we can hope for. So that's my version of motivation. So solve your problems for you.